to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Anya, we're here, and we're so well nourished from last night's amazing meal that you, I've never been in a situation where, well, I suppose I've been with a fisherman who's pulled a fish fresh from the water, cleaned it, made ceviche like right on the boat, but that's probably the closest approximation to what happened last night because the animals that you brought and the cuts and the meats and the liver and everything were from your farm that you've been responsible for the last decade helping to nourish the soil the crops the birth the life the butchering every aspect of the animal then you bring it and you're also a master chef and so we got to take this know that someone was with the entire life cycle of the food that we were eating bone marrow i mean it was incredible and it it was something that was very viscerally we were all very viscerally aware of of the difference of taking our food from that and having somebody who's a steward of that food all the way through. I mean, it was really a beautiful experience. Thank you. Yeah, the, the ability to create very simple food like that is predicated on just amazing ingredients. And in meat, it's all about handling and curation. The modern supply system in meat, it's, you know, there's 15 people minimum between when the cow is born and when you eat it. And by people, I mean, you know, corporations and entities that are involved in all the different aspects of fabrication and processing and transport. Uh, so the single source makes a really big difference because of the curation. Mm -hmm. So what, what was it that made you decide, all right, I'm gonna start Belcampo Farms. Like, I'm gonna do this. What was, the, what was the driving force that said, this doesn't exist or maybe it does exist, but I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this better than everybody else? For my narrative that, and I have a co-founder who's very crucial to this whole story, but the personal interest in meat came from my own health journey. I was a vegetarian um, throughout my teens and struggled with anemia. I was a competitive athlete, struggled with energy levels. I moved to Europe, um, and I was actually working as a cheesemaker. And um, I had been interested in Wait, food. doesn't that have a cool name? What's a cheesemaker? Uh, uh, casado in Italian. Uh, casado, okay. As a casada. A fromager, fromager, <laughs> a fromagerino. <laughs> I don't know. I thought there was some other. Fromagerino. Uh, yeah. Great. I love it. Um, but yeah, I had gotten interested in cooking. I mean, I've always been interested in cooking. I loved ingredients. I love food. I was baking, and I made my own fresh buttermilks for baking, started making cheese. And so I ended up decided to pursue that. Mm -hmm. I moved to Europe. I was working as a cheesemaker. And um, this is right after I graduated from college uh, and I was you know, 21. I started eating what the farm families that I worked with ate. And so you're talking about a girl who grew up like in the snack wall generation. And, you know, we prepare for a, a, a rowing meat with like a big thing of like no fat spaghetti, right? With spaghetti, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that. Carb up. Carb up. It's Carb craziness, up. right? <laughs> and so I went from that to basically, you know, getting up at two in the morning to work, milking animals, uh, making cheese. And then at 11, you'd eat like 5,000 calories of animal products, right? Mm -hmm. That was the rhythm of the day. Then you have a very light dinner. You have like soup for dinner and vegetables and salads and things like that. But the the midday meal was this mountain of cheese and eggs and butter and meat and, and starches. And um, I felt phenomenal. Mm. And my health just turned a real corner. My mood changed. Like everything in my body changed for the better. And yeah. um, I... You know, I stayed in that in that world. I actually ended up working on the business side of cheese then for a number of years. And then from there, I moved into microfinance, always staying in Italy in that time. And I, I just, I didn't want to leave behind that feeling of just vitality and mm -hmm. positive mood and just that things around my health just felt very simple. And what I'd done is basically taken on kind of a mix of like intermittent fasting and kind of a keto or low carb diet and, you know, probably half 
to 75% of my calories coming from animals. And I think for my you know type, that worked really well. And when I moved back to the US, my health really fell off the rails. And it was, it was a, I think because I was eating just, you know, I didn't understand how careful you got to be about where you get your food right. right when I moved home. I just didn't, I hadn't really evolved my understanding of the changes that I've made. I didn't have a perspective on the changes that I'd made. Well, we can look at the macronutrient profile and that's helpful. It's helpful to understand the macronutrients, but there's so many other aspects of the food that come in. Some, you know, obviously micronutrients, which are different depending on a cow has grazed on grass or whether it's been fed a bunch of corn mm -hmm. and all of the, so those are actually measurable, measurable in compounds like CLA, mm -hmm. which is available in animal meats when they've actually, and butter, when they've actually grazed on grass, that's not available when they're not. So we can measure it in certain aspects, but I, I also truly feel and believe that there's metaphysical aspects as well, the energetics of the food. Mm -hmm that we are energetic beings. And those things aren't as easily measured except by in the aggregate based on subjective sensations and feelings. Well, think about when you, you're you at Costco and you see a bunch of daffodils compared to what a daffodil looks like if you stumble across it in a meadow growing in nature. Yeah, I don't know what the difference is on a cellular level, but I sure as heck know this is different. Yeah, totally. And it's not just because I'm outside, right? Like the flower is smaller, but it's more perfect. The colors are brighter. There's no damage. Um, you know, the fruits and vegetables that we see just from a physiological perspective in, in mainstream commerce, they're like bloated and and mushy. Um, they fall apart quickly. They rot quickly. Like there's all these things that appear to be different on a cellular level between these fast growing organisms and slower growing, more traditionally raised ones. I think it does come back to soil quality, which I think is connected to energy. Mm -hmm. Micronutrient density in food is directly related to soil density and carbon. Sure, because what is feeding? What is feeding all of these things? It's the soil. It's all of the nutrients in the soil. Where do you? How do you think a flower grows by magic? Yeah, and fairy dust and air. No, it comes from the soil actually drawing up in the water, drawing up all of those minerals and all of those nutrients to create the plant, which then the animal eats. And then draws back in to make all the bones and the fascia and the muscle and, and every aspect of the animal. Well, if we look at, I mean, thinking about the flower, right? If we look at a, that Costco flower, they're grown in great density. They're fertilized with nitrogen, right? You look at the meadow flower, it's spaced out. It's being fertilized naturally through the regenerative you know, soil density that's there already. So it's it's all, I mean, it's, it's a question of resources, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a question of access to resources. So I think it's energetic in, in that whole system health, right, is a key indicator of soil carbon density and soil carbon vitality. I mean, it's not just like nutrients. The nutrients are fixed in the soil through a micronutrient cycle that's driven by nematodes and a mi whole microbiome. The mm -hmm. soil has a whole microbiome, just like your gut has a microbiome. And just like in your body, that gut microbiome is so important for your health, the soil's health won't exist if that microbiome is destroyed. And the chemicals that we use, you know, the Roundup, most prevalent ch chemical in the US, that is demonstrated to kill the microbiome of soil. It's just like if you go on a cycle of heavy antibiotics and cephalexin or zithromycin for a long time or whatever it might be, fucking Accutane, doesn't matter. If you put a, put a bunch of an antibiotics in your body, you're gonna deplete your internal microbiome in your stomach. And if you spray a bunch of fields with glyphosate, you're gonna do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then this is leading to so many different health challenges. That's why all of the wisdom is coming back to gut health, and then people on the frontier saying, okay, okay, great. Gut health is super important, but what about the soil health, which is leading to the things you eat, which put in your gut, and really understanding the holistic perspective of this rather than that singular myopic focus of this bacteria bad, this pest bad, destroy it. What are the, okay, what are the other costs? What are the, what are the things that are happening beyond just that myopic look? Well, there's a lot of, you know, other casualties and damage and, and, but nobody's really looking at that. Yeah, Collateral yeah. damage everywhere, but nobody's really counting that tally. You know, that mindset that you're lining out is what's gotten us into so much trouble in meat. And the reason now that meat is, we've, we're almost deciding culturally just to not eat it anymore mm -hmm. because it's so bad. It's so bad for the planet. It's so bad for our health. And the problem is, yeah, we've created, we've toxified an extremely healthy food 
through a system that's been always engineered just for cost. And those negative benefits that you're talking about, like if you look at the totality, I mean, women who live near confinement firms have a much higher incident of stillborns and low birth weight babies. Men and women who live near, near I mean, talking within three miles of a farm where these animals are, much higher incidence of um, antibiotic resistance and asthma. So the negative effects of this cheap system, it's not even just in their product, it's the whole world around it. It's the whole ecosystem of that. Mm. So we've driven this cost down. And, and with meat, it's complicated because um, you don't really want to know a lot because an animal has to die, right? right? And that's a really hard thing for a lot of people to grapple with. Um, I'm always amazed when... You know, I no longer post images of like pig faces if they're dead on my feed or do anything because I've realized people are so startled and it's like, well, of course it has a face, it's an animal. Right. But we want some, we, we've we asked for gating around that. And with that gating, we, we sort of have this myopic understanding that the beef is just, you know, steaks in ground beef. <laughs> there's no feet and there's no face. And we don't really want to know much more than that. When I remember I first started to understand this because when I first moved to um, Italy, I lived in Sicily. I lived in a really rural area of Sicily. And there was a little butcher shop in the town that I lived in. And every week they'd get one cow. And on the first day of the week, on Monday, they would get the organs in because that's what parishes goes bad fastest. And then by Friday, they would have the roasts because those would have aged for a few days. But every week they just worked it. So on Monday and Tuesday, you could buy organs and viscera and like some shanks and stuff. And then throughout the week, then you could get some ground meats and things. But you actually saw them and they sold the head too. You know, they sold all the bits and every week it was like one or two cows depending on the season. And I'd never even understood that there was any seasonality, any order, any rhythm to meat. Um, but it was so amazing to me that I was like, oh, they're actually selling their way through a cow every week. Yeah. And you look at the way that we interact with meat now, it's it's the most sterile. Um, and people are so squeamish about meat looking like animals. And I say, you should actually be extremely concerned when you see meat that doesn't look like animals. Be right. very afraid of the dinosaur-shaped chicken nugget. Because <laughs> that's way more terrifying than a pig face, like yeah, yeah, where it yeah. should be in terms of your safety and your children's safety and and health, right? When I The first time I went hunting was a really important experience for me because I was probably, I don't know, 32 when I first went hunting and been eating meat a long time. And it was, a, it was a very spiritual experience for me. And I treated it in that way as best I could. Obviously, it was my first time hunting, but, you know, understanding Native American indigenous spirituality and understanding, you know, in that very much as it was portrayed in Avatar, like how you kill an animal and the, and the prayers that you make. And, you know, so ultimately took a, took a black buck doe from the field and then came and, and was with it when it gave its last breath and actually you know plunged a knife in its heart to shorten that lifespan even though it was a good shot and just had my hands said a prayer and it was such a beautiful experience and then we took the animal carried it from the field and then strung it up and then i was involved in cleaning i had some coaching on how to how to clean it because i've never done it before but then feeling like all of the different fascia and understanding how it worked and then touching the tenderloin which is like oh tenderloin it's a good cut it's nice and tender well why is the tenderloin tender it's because they don't use that muscle as much it's not like the haunches it's not like the shanks that they're constantly clawing up the rocky crags and and figuring out you know and running away from predators with that there that muscle is used occasionally when they have to make a cut or when they have like it's for mating too exactly yeah so it's so it's those muscles are used more sparingly so they're soft yeah. and they're tender and that's yeah. what makes them delicious but getting my hands in the warm animal and the body of it and feeling it and being connected to it, it almost felt like that should be a prerequisite mm. for meat eaters. Yeah. Like if you're gonna eat meat, this should you should really know, like you should understand at least with that. And honestly, to even eat chicken, like I feel like if I'm gonna have a, the right relationship with a chicken or a turkey, I should probably do the same thing with a chicken or a turkey. I just haven't prioritized it. Mm -hmm to the right degree however i still feel like oh, that's my bad like i i should actually know every animal and understand every animal that i'm consuming mm -hmm. yeah the beauty of warm processing and processing a hunted animal is that the way that the muscles still move and the fascia still function 
that's one interesting thing, um, you know, running a slaughterhouse, yeah. which we have our own slaughterhouse at, at my company. We have like a different approach to it where, you I mean, in, in traditional cultures, you see animals being broken with hooks because you can simply pull those muscles apart. So everything's been sort of like with the refrigeration, it literally like congeals the process. Right. And we slice against the lines as opposed to following the natural fibers too, which is such an analogy for a lot of ways that we do things in our culture, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just to like stop and then control yeah. <laughs> as opposed to understanding the way the pieces work together. Um, I, you know, I, 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 you know, for many years operationally ran a slaughterhouse and still I'm not super comfortable with the act of, of death and, and killing. Um, that just might be my makeup. And I, you know, I do think that farm um, kids that grow up with 4-H and have to go through that whole cycle, it's a really important learning exercise. But I agree with you that even though we might not all be able to participate in death and participate in processing, the understanding of the responsibility of it is really key. Because from my perspective, if I, as a consumer, take ethical responsibility for consuming meat, I need to think about the impact of my actions with regards to that meat's life and the people who interacted with that meat and the communities around that, right? So it's a circle of responsibility. Yep. And that's where I think you can, even if you're not ready to get out there and kill, you can start to action the changes you want to see in the world through your choices and everything. Right. And meat is now kind of like this linchpin of a thing. Because I think if we lean, continue along this, you know, this really bifurcated path, we're going to always have meat, but it's going to be a real privilege, privilege of the elite, right? And then it looks like there's this massive effort to get all the other meat turned into fake meat, right? Um, and that's really kind of terrifying even from a social justice perspective and a health perspective to me. So I think we're in a moment right now where we could push for more regenerative production on a larger scale, which could have a massive positive climate impact as well. Right. As opposed to just saying, you know, meat's terrible, let's switch to highly processed, really toxic for our bodies. And also, by the way, worse carbon footprint than regeneratively raised meat by far, mm. right? I mean, our burgers have a or climate positive carbon sequestering. We're a net carbon positive operator at my company, including everything, the entire picture of the company. Which like pause for pause for a moment and let that sink in because that is not the information that people get. Because mm -hmm. what what is being shown is the most densely populated factory farm. And then everybody's saying, meat, bad for the environment. Well, that is a dramatic oversimplification. Meat you know, animals raised in this particular manner, very bad for the environment, very bad for the soil, very bad for the entire ecosystem. But there's other ways to do it that are net, as you said, net positive. And like, that's something to be mindful of. Like, okay, there's another way that we can do this, you know? And if we actually lean in, you know, we can make and make significant demands and changes in this whole industry. And we can make a bigger change in the environment. Yeah. I mean, our ruminant species on this planet have the power to to save us, right? That's what's incredible is that we can use ruminant agriculture to actually sequester carbon in the soil. It's a in the 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 rough understanding is that you 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 have certain types of ecosystems that can simply be improved through ruminant engagement because they're naturally quite what's considered brittle. So not very much water, right? And they're not, not very naturally rich soils. So they're not like alluvial plains or places like the Central Valley that have all this great abundance. Those kind of brittle ecosystems throughout history are where you have giant migratory herds of animals and the ecosystem has facilitated those migratory herds of animals. You're talking about like sub-Saharan Africa and, you know, mm -hmm. there's giant in, in America, in the prairies, right? Yeah. So we have this great historical context in the U.S. of having created the Dust Bowl, having created a, a wasteland um, by taking ruminants away, killing millions of bison. And within years, the, the Dust Bowl happened and the greatest prairie ecosystem of the United States collapsed, right? That was a man-made catastrophe that was caused by us removing, by killing and fencing the ruminants. Yeah, they were, which was yeah. also the most ridiculous, you know, most ridiculous act because part of the motivation for killing all of the buffalo, which were a big part of the, the ruminant population, was not because people were hungry; they were trying to starve the indigenous population from their primary food source. Right, like yeah. so, what 
unbelievable evil that was that was being now we're still living with the consequences of that evil which is then coming back in that karmic retribution to all of us Mm -hmm. like oh wow well this is you know this is the actions that we're going to pay from the crimes of our you know the this country's founders in a way Mm -hmm. no there's a there's a a legacy in the united states of trying to kind of make nature into nature by removing things, right? Trying to control all these different systems, but doing it with a myopic view of just one or two things. You know, you were mentioning antibiotics before. I think it's a similar type of approach where we say, oh, you're sick, let's fix this one thing. Let's bombard this one aspect. Sure. Your back hurts, let's do the surgery to change this one thing. And you don't realize that then all the other muscles are going to get out of whack, right? So we have this approach where we're comfortable, you know, again and again, <laughs> sort of bombarding one little factor and not looking at the whole picture. And in in the beef industry too, you know, something to keep in mind is in the United States right now, we've had a massive shift in the past three or four years, you know, thanks to people like you starting to educate about, you know, maybe having a bunch of hyper-processed carbohydrates first thing in the morning is not awesome for your health or your children's health. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this die-off of CPG brands, of consumer brands. There's been a flattening of lots of sugar-driven carb-driven foods. There still hasn't been a shift in obesity, right? We still have the same problems, but some of the consumption patterns are changing. And in those patterns of people starting to be more cognizant about processed food, there's a gap. What's the processed food we can sell now? And that's where I see the imitation meat. I mean, to be cynical about it, and you have to kind of be cynical in these days, like I also see big industry looking for a niche and looking for yeah. an opportunity and creating a market. Well, and there's also been this conflation between the idea that vegetarian is inherently m- more healthy. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, it just is. It just is. And it's like this this argument where it it's not it's just like, "Oh, of course it is. Of course it's more healthy." But the more you look into it, even studying, you know, people on a even an extreme diet like a carnivore diet like Dr. Paul Saladino, you know, who's doing a living experiment Mm-hmm. about this diet and like what it's actually like and going with the different african tribes and studying with them who mm-hmm. have this entirely animal-based diet and looking at their longevity all of these different things and then ketogenic diets and all of these different ways that we're looking at it's not accurate you know a vegetarian diet can be incredibly healthy and incredibly cleansing depending on the input that you're getting you know depending on how you're managing it and so can uh carnivore diet depending on the input depending on how much how many organs you're having depending on where those organs are sourced depending on how you manage it there's so many different ways but really the fundamental thing comes down to where is everything coming from and how diverse you know is the diet of either what you're eating eating or what you're eating directly Mm -hmm. what is the diversity that you're spreading across and i think for me the the big thing like when i when i had my first bite of bel campo meat I could feel, literally feel, what could only be described as life force energy, which Mm -hmm. is something that Dr. Zach Bush talks about too, like life force energy that I was consuming into my body. Mm -hmm. And I'm very confident that beyond the micros and the macros, which are important, if you just focused your diet on life force energy Mm -hmm. rich foods, Mm -hmm. it would make a significant impact. So if I think about that in our animals' lives, you know, I've I've designed our systems with our team around birth, mothering, mating, childbearing, child rearing, and an evolutionary diet throughout that. So we create or we've looked at those as, you know, in the initial days of the company, like how do we make every sex every part of this animal's life in those key moments, right? Those key moments of life as akin to they as they would be in, in nature. And the biggest difference I've seen, if I can summarize it in one aspect of a regenerative system like Bell Campos and conventional, is that everything is moving much more slowly. Muscle tissue is building much more slowly. Adolescence happens much later. Secondary sexual characteristics develop later um, than fatting out and actually gaining the important extra muscular fat that you need um, to, to take a beef to processing into full weight all happens much more slowly. Then on a like a sensory level, I notice in our meats, in addition to the energetic piece, which I pick up on as well, 
you know, I, I taste meat and certain meats that I taste from the conventional system make me feel sad, mm. right? Like I actually feel down um, mm. and it's a funny thing. I mean, I taste our, our competitors' products all the time. And so there's certain things that I can say, you know, wow, that there's a reason for that. And there's other things that I just need to, to understand are important emotions to observe, right? But the other interesting aspect with slow growing is you have this very beautiful solubility. So when you eat conventional meat, most of our meat leaves a, re a residue on your tongue. You know that you kind of have this like, it's like a like a curd almost, like a little bit of like strands and you're kind of chewing on it. It's a little gummy. And when people tell me that they love game, right? And they love their first experience of game, I'm often hearing that they like the solubility. They mm. like the lightness. They like the energy that they feel, right? So in, I think also this kind of excitement about game, which I think is amazing because it's very similar to our product in terms of cooking and experience. But it's like, oh, I had this meat that had this solubility, this absorption, this immediate kind of engagement with my body, and it wasn't such a chore to eat it. Because we've also gotten ourselves into a real problematic system by making this meat that's very chewy, very low solubility, doesn't taste like very much. So it's bland, it's chewy, it's lethargic, it's heavy, it's, it's hard on our system. And so we're putting all this makeup on it. You know, we're like sugar sauce, soy sauce, you know, all these marinades things. And I, you know, I, I get these, um, you know, comments all the time. Like, oh, I have this great recipe. And it's like, you know, this much sugar and this much soy and this much that, and then peanuts and all these things. And you're like, what, just try salt. <laughs> and good meat yeah and then if you want to try something you know i always am, am like dialing back on spice like i want spice to just exalt and meet the product but my goal is make a product that's in and of itself has that great taste where you're not doing very much to it you know that that's the because that that's also where you can discover more of health you know you're paying attention you're very enlightened around this to a really tight feedback circle in terms of your own health right that's something I'm learning to do too. And it, that's really why I fell in love with working on farms. Mm. I was observing this like immediate energetic loop of like, oh my God, I feel amazing. I want more of this, right? And unfortunately, I think in our diet context in the US, we don't have many opportunities to get into that groove, right? Yeah. And to build that. So I, I also think, you know, you were, yesterday we were talking about um, smelling food. And these things where you can kind of wake up your own energy and your own magic around food. Um, and that's all a set of skills, smell, taste, sensuality, paying attention, you know, paying attention to absorption, paying attention to how you feel immediately and in the moment, allowing yourself to feel the emotions, right, around food. These are things that we don't um, talk about because they've also been sort of actively discouraged in our industrial yeah, system. Yeah, and, and, and internally discouraged in a certain way. Like imagine you have a pack of meat, you know, and you just, you're going to look at the date and you're going to trust that it's okay. But if you smell it, you might find that something's not quite right. And then what are you going to do? How are you going to cook dinner totally. that night? So yeah. might as well just, let's, let's just put it in the pan and then we'll heat it and then everything will be okay. But the first thing when we were cooking yesterday, well, you were cooking, I was just there. But the first thing we were doing was pulled the bone marrow bones out and you offered me to smell it. And like really getting in and I could tell like, oh dear, uh, is this going to smell bad? You know, but it didn't, it smelled, you know, it didn't smell bad at all. And it's like imagining it, it's the same with anything with, with a fish or with a, with a meat or with, just actually allowing those senses to come in and allowing those instincts that have been latent and dormant to take over and say, oh yeah, all right, this smells good. This smells like my body actually wants it. And then when we ate the bone marrow that you deliciously cooked with a little lemon zest and some salt, simple preparation on some sourdough toast, it was like, yes, like this is, this is good. I also think getting into the space of energy and absorption that smelling your food half an hour, an hour before you're gonna eat it has to in some way prime your body because sure. there is a whole process for me of just how much I love to cook and cook for people and feed people. And that's really gratifying to me for a lot of reasons. But I also know in my own body when I take the time to like really pay attention to the pieces and also allow myself to pay attention to my intuition. A lot of times when I'm cooking, I'll smell things and I'll just think about it. And I'll sort of, in my mind's like Rolodex, I like clip through some things of like, do I want lemon? Do I want spice? Do I want heat? Do I want warmth? Do I want, you know, what are the different? And then it's like, oh, that's the way I want to go with it. And I've taught myself to do that 
um, over the years because it's like it always yields a better food. If I'm not like going to be dead set on like I'm making this with chimichurri or I'm making this with a spice rub, like I'll I'll smell it and 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 sort of vibe on it, and mm. it makes for better food because I'm paying attention to the to my own senses, right? And I'm and I'm positively reinforcing you know my own senses. I did a, a thing recently where I asked on just on Instagram like hey, who washes their chicken because I'd heard people wash their chicken, and most people said I wash my chicken. Just so you know, washing your chicken is bad. If it is dirty, if it does have a fecal-borne pathogen on it, like um, Campylobacter or Salmonella, if you wash it, you get it all over your sink and it ends up in your salads and stuff too. So it's a bad idea to wash your chicken, just as an aside. But when I asked why, they most people are saying, well, I don't like, it smells bad. And I'm thinking, like, if you were to buy, like, a shirt and you, <laughs> you got it home and you're like, it smells so bad, I got to wash it. Would you ever buy anything again from that company? Like, no. or it's all, it's obviously like it's oozing liquid, you know, like <laughs> and yeah. you never, ever go back to that store. But somehow with food, we've gotten into this mentality of like, we don't smell it. And when we do, we wash it off because it smells so bad. Right. So that's like, to me, it's like, there's the opportunity for growth of, for us culturally to say like, let's demand stuff that that smells so good we want to smell it because it inspires us to cook with it. Yeah. Right? That's a that's a place we could get to. And I think we'd all be healthier, you know, as a result. And for people who are thinking, oh, it's just woo-woo, smelling it is not going to actually make any change. I mean, let me put you through one visceral example, which is imagine you're cutting a lemon, feel the lemon in your hands, cut it, cut that wedge, and then hold that wedge above your mouth and then just drip the drops of that lemon juice into your tongue. Imagine you doing that and let it hit your tongue and then see what happens in your mouth. We're salivating, right? Like as that happens, as we're preparing. So the mind's thoughts signaling to the body to produce saliva. Well, this goes all the way down to the insulin release. In my book, Own the Day, Own Your Life, talk about a clinical study where they they fed a group a really high sugar milkshake and a group a really low sugar milkshake but they switched them and so they fed you know they gave them one and then the other one but they told them it was the opposite you know so they had the control and then the opposite so when they told people that the low sugar keto milkshake was full of sugar the body dumped a bunch of insulin to respond to the sugar and when they told people the opposite the body responded in a different way based on the information that was in the brain and the actual response, the blood sugar response, everything was actually different. Well, how is that even possible? Well, so much more is possible when the mind is activated. So that process of washing your chicken, you're basically washing saying, dirty, gross chicken, dirty, gross, bad chicken. Okay, you're going to put that in your mouth then. And then in, in at that point, what's your body going to say? Oh, dirty, gross chicken. Let me try to eliminate this as fast as possible because the signal that you've been giving me body mind has been giving me body is this is bad and so of course it's going to make a difference of course the more you like the more you know and trust that your food is going to be nourishing and you get involved in that process signaling it all the way through even taking that moment before you eat it to be like thank you for nourishing food and and the trust and the faith of where it comes from it makes a dramatic difference Mm -hmm. and all you have to do is look at some of those placebo nocebo studies involving food to know that that's absolutely the case beyond just what is actually happening with the metaphysics of the energy yeah. it's also what the mind is is convincing the body of absolutely i mean our mind is so connected to our gut right how yeah. many of the pathologies and healthy attitudes around food are all about your attitude and your mind think about it too you know if we eat that chicken that smells bad and we wash it off and then we put some teriyaki sauce on it and then serve it with a bowl of ranch and then we have chronic indigestion and you know the most common prescription now is antacids right like people are taking medicating with antacids like more yep. men than not use antacids after every major meal right so it's like our body is telling us like ah this is stressful and we're just like suppress the symptoms right you know just like same, hide that pain same it's, philosophy the whole like way that our um system of 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 um you know purchasing animals i've been amazed to see in in africa um in meat markets like i love watching how meat is sold and ev- everywhere i can go right but the way that in in traditional cultures meat selling is is warm you know they often don't have air conditioning so you're very aware if the meat is off yeah 
and you want to smell it. Like I've seen people in Africa, like smelling the, the organs, like is this fresh? They'll have the viscera, they have the guts of the animal on display, the viscera with undigested food in the viscera to show that it was killed recently. So they're not hiding the animalness of the animal, right? They're just like putting that front and center because that's you as a consumer taking care of your health, taking care of your business, right? You're, you want to know that. And you compare that, that's an extreme, but compare that to a grocery store in America where it smells hyper sanitized. It smells like sanitation spray, right? And you walk past the herbs, you don't smell any herbs. You walk past the meat, you don't smell any meat. You sometimes smell a little bit of the seafood, which is kind of scary because think about how much they're putting in the air to hide that smell. Right. So everything's chilled down and, and you're blasting scent over it. So we're basically, it's like we got our hands behind our back because we're not being allowed to use our most potent tool in food selection and our most important feedback loop for our own health and nutrition, right? So we're being asked to make misinformed decisions. Of course, we're going to run to the aisle with the bright colors and the like photographs of crunchy stuff. Yep. Because whatever, none of it smells good anyways. I bet if we walk past the peaches and they smelled like ripe peaches and the peak of summer, we would eat the heck out of that. Yeah. Or, you know, when you go to a, a bakery that's that cooking that fresh sourdough loaf. Yeah. You're like... Fuck. That's why you the know, bakery like, companies at the airport put the fake <laughs> yeah. smell out of the baked goods, right? Yeah, totally. No, it's it's amazing. Like what these are these are the things that we can I mean, we can make we can build our intention around relearning these skills, right? You can fight back by relearning these skills. And that you know, the first thing you can do is like when you if you do want to question your meat or ask about it, start to trust your own instincts. You know, yeah. smell it deeply and say, Does this feel good to me? You're not going to, I think, you know, in terms of like the actual confinement system and those aspects of animal husbandry that you might want to avoid, you're going to have to rely on labels and things, right? But you can also use your eyes. You know, I'm always uh, amazed when I get the feedback on our chickens that people are like, I could never make your chicken cooked fully because it's always pink. And <laughs> it's because the animals run. They have a lot of musculature. And the musculature is well oxidized because it's lean, powerful muscles. And so it is going to be a darker pink color. Mm. We want our meat to be white. And white is like the color of confinement. Right. You know, it's an animal that's in a box that can't develop any muscles and can't use it, have any of the heme deposits in those muscles. People think about the chicken eggs, which, you know, Joe Rogan's made a big deal about it. You know, the, the yellow, that sickly, pale, pallid yellow that you see from a conventional egg, like when you go to a hotel buffet or something, they have the hard boiled eggs. It's like, I, it's revolting actually. But then you go get a real farm egg and it's this deep, rich orange. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I think that people really understand. Like, okay, just like with salmon, you yeah. actually have to dye salmon that's farm raised uh, with red pellets to give it that rich, rich, you know color of the astaxanthin that would naturally go through the entire meat they have to dye the meat to get it to look like that and this and i didn't even realize that that was the same with chicken meat mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. you know everything changes color everything I mean, yeah. pork being the other white meat pork uh, in our butcher shops we have butcher shops in california as well and in those shops people come in and they're like where's the pork because you look at our pork next to the beef and it's like three shades lighter than the beef and our beef is a really deep, dark red because it's also free range, et cetera. But the pork naturally is very deep red. Mm. Pork being a white meat, part of its genetics, it was selected for actually for white hair, for transparent hair on confinement pork because you always end up with pig hair follicles in the skin and adjacent to the fat cap. So to make it more appealing for customers to have that hair follicle be transparent as opposed to being black, which is a traditional color, was a big goal of the modern pork breeding industry. So we bred out the any color in the hair and we bred out as much color as possible and intramuscular fat in the pigs. I mean, pigs were uh, engineered in this country initially. The early genetic selection in pigs in history, starting back you know, thousands of years, was towards them being a fat source, right? So Historically, we engineered pigs to be like the four-legged olive tree, or there's right. actually pigs that are called like American lard pigs that look like a Sharpe that have all this, you know, extra muscular fat naturally. But in the, you know, 40s onwards, um, pork was looking to reposition as a lean meat as fat slowly fell out of favor. And um, the result is this very, very lean, very pale, very dry from a culinary perspective, really boring product. And unfortunately, they kind of, you know, walked 
towards what was health at the time and walked away from flavor and all sorts of different things with that engineering. Yeah. So that's why I think too, pork is the most heavily sauced. It's a little funny to me, pork naturally when it's really free range and, and it, you know, pigs are complex to me to eat because it's a very intelligent animal. You know, raising them, we see that they're emotional, they're connected, they're funny, they're like dogs, right? So they, I actually think that, you know, they, the, um, the number of cultures that don't eat pork and people who don't eat pork for various reasons probably connected to the, you know, the fact that they're pretty pinnacle in terms of natural intelligence. Um, and they're very, it's very easily become, you know, connected to them. But they are are just, you know, naturally can produce this very sweet meat. And it doesn't have to do with eating apples and, and pumpkins. There's sometimes this assumption that you can feed something sweet and it turns out sweet. It actually has more to do, in my experience, with um, lack of cortisol. So cortisol in an animal, uh, in extreme stress, it can create a flush. And in pigs, it's very pronounced. It's like a, it's called cortisol spotting. In in beef, it's less pronounced. But in moments of trauma and stress, you'll get these dark flushes in the meat. Well, they're all as it, it goes hand in hand with them being a more sentient animal mm -hmm. as well. Because yeah. so the suffering sure. that a pig is going to endure just like a human like a human if a human was in the confinement of these animals that human would experience misery beyond you know anything that was in the animal kingdom because of our sentience same with a monkey same with a mm -hmm. dolphin same with the the higher you know the higher you go on the complexity of the consciousness of the animal mm -hmm. the more suffering it potentially endures mm -hmm. which goes with you know there's wisdom from the ayahuasca tradition about the dieta, and you're trying to get energetically and physically as clean as possible. Mm -hmm. But there are these general rules. But I think really what they're pointing to is they're trying to keep you clean of these negative energetics, the mm -hmm. meat that makes you sad, mm -hmm. the meat, because that's going to come up and you're going to feel, you're going to feel that when you're radically blown open and sensitive from this medicine. Pork is always on the top, the top of the list of the animal not to eat. Well, I do believe that it's because they are suffering more than any other animal mm -hmm. when they're treated in that way. I can only imagine, I haven't had the opportunity to test it, but when I have pork close to ayahuasca, I can feel it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and whereas if I had a grass-fed beef, it feels great. Like the energetics of that are like, okay. And a bel campo, in bel campo meat, which I had the fortune to have some of your carnitas, you know, mm -hmm. not too long, it felt great. But I think it's really... You know, anybody who believes at all in any kind of homeopathy or does anything where they kind of put energy into their water, and this is all a little bit metaphysical fringe, and I understand that, but the idea is that energetics matter. And you're imagining that, you know, some small homeopathic tincture is going to have the impact that an animal that suffered for eight years and taken on that and all of the physiological, actual physiological things like the cortisol spotting that you're talking. Yeah. We're not just talking about pure energetics. There's actual physical manifestations of that stress, just like a human under that much stress exactly. is going to deteriorate. The animals are. So you have both the energetics and the biologics of this thing. It's going to make a big, big difference in 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 your well, in your energy if field. If a cortisol spot happens under a moment of huge stress around processing, anytime there's social anxiety, um, you know, any number of different things that happen during the course, there's a light wash of that same hormone, right? So there's all these like adrenal and endocrine things that are happening at a soft level in their extreme form. We see them in a big defect in the meat but they're gonna be happening. So I think that's the kind of energetic build that we can talk about that's an actual physiological change is that this long, it's the same thing we can see, you know, in stunting in people who have emotional stress, right? Yeah. There's just, that's yeah. proven, right? And that's nothing to do with being hit on the head. You're just being hit emotionally and you're shorter, that happens. So there's gonna always be, you know, these animals are in, I, I actually recently was talking to a pig farmer who farms right up next to us in, in Northern California. And he, he had brought in some animals from a confinement farm. He had purchased some. I, I don't know the whole backstory on why, um, but he said, you know, it's the last time I'm ever going to do that because he said, I brought these pigs in and they behave like class five felons. They picked a lock to where I had a pregnant sow. They kicked her until she aborted her fetus and then killed her. And this was just pigs doing it to another pig. Wow. But these are the pigs that, is, that had come out of a confinement. You think about it, you know, these, uh, we... 
when I talk about these moments in, in an animal's life of paying attention to, you know, the nursing and the child, you know, rearing moments and paying attention to mating and you're paying attention to the key moments in evolutionary diet, access to resources, access, you know, an, an easy social environment, right, where you have a natural hierarchy that you can be part of in your group of animals and then an evolutionary diet and a chance to be with your young. Those are kind of the basic rights that we line out in a confinement system you have a huge competition for resources. You're in the dark and you're unable to move. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a tragically, I mean, every aspect that's going to yield these physiological benefits that we know about, you know, getting up in the morning and making sure you get some sunlight and get some movement in and eat something healthy when you get hungry. Like that's all, I mean, we're all animals, right? Mm. So if you look at the, the day in the, these confinement animals, um, it's... It's pretty terrifying. I, I recently, you know, I put up something about how animals are, chickens are all de-beaked because they're under so much stress that they peck each other to death um, if they are not, if their beaks aren't cut off. And somebody from the conventional industry put a comment on like, well, you know that broilers, which is meat chickens, are not de-beaked. And I'm, yes, because they only live for two and a half weeks. So they just don't have time to get around to it, mm. right? Like it's the only times when these shortcuts aren't taken is when the lifespan is so short yep. that those characteristics can't develop. You know, it's actually just, there's no compassion in that system. Um, and if, it, it, I, I, I think it's, it's something that we are, you know, we, we pay the price for in our health. Because to me, there's a, there's a direct correlation to how we raise our animals and how we're raising ourselves now, right? And we're locking ourselves into a paradigm of lack of movement, lack of light, lack of natural social interactions, highly processed diet. And we've created an analogous system for our animals, but we're in a trap with them, you know, and there's a chance to 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 break free, but it's not easy. You know, yeah. it's a lot of work to do things this way. The <clears throat> one of the arguments for maintaining the conventional meat practices is that if we didn't, we wouldn't be able to feed the population. Right. Because as you said, you know, the amount of animals per per acre on Belcampo, a lot smaller the amount of time it takes for the animals to mature it's a lot longer so a lot of people will say well well shit we got so many people to feed and so many you know so many mouths to feed basically like we have to have these chickens packed in here and we have to have these cows packed in and these pigs packed in because people need to eat you know like as much as you might want to disparage mcdonald's like it is feeding a great number of people in mm -hmm. our nation right so what is your what is your viewpoint of how if we had the consciousness and the desire to do this how this could proliferate to a sustainable nationwide program where people were still being fed and nourished in the right way we have masses of underutilized grazing land in this country right we have enormous resources in terms of nature that we could be using for a regenerative approach this would also have a positive climate impact but i think the you know, to, to the here and the now, today in the U.S., we throw away somewhere between 35 and 45 percent of the meat that we produce. It goes right into the trash can. So animals live and die in hell, and it is thrown away because it's artificially cheap, mm. right? So we would address um, the food waste issues really concretely and quickly yeah. were we to adjust our prices of meat to the sure. real cost of meat. Also, we do have incredibly cheap meat, but it's founded on a system where I pay for every day that our animals are on grass. A feedlot operator gets subsidized feed. So it's a completely warped system because the corn and soy and other feeds that we're using, those are all subsidized crops. So you basically get free feed or freer feed if you are feeding animals a maladaptive, non-evolutionary mm. diet in the case of so beef. So we're incentivizing the opposite way. If we were to simply correct that, grass-fed beef would become a hell of a lot more competitive, <clears throat> right? And the ugly truth is this is going to increase in price. Okay, that's an adjustment that would rectify a 30 to 50 year distortion of meat prices, right? right? And this would be looked at as a blip in history where meat became incredibly cheap, right? You look in, in most countries in the world and meat is on the side and occasionally at the center of the table. 
right? So yeah, it would mean an adjustment in you're not going to have a meat buffet where people nibble at it and it all goes to waste. Like there are certain habits that we have today, but it's it's kind of, it goes against the American dream. You know, you look in Italy and the meatballs are this big and in Rhode Island, the meatballs are this big, <laughs> right? Like it's been so awesome in America that we had all this meat. We came from all these impoverished countries and we figured out this way to make this really rare, like food of kings, everyday items yeah. we throw it in our kids lunches and if they don't eat it we're like it's cool don't worry mm. you know it's super cheap it's, you know it's, and you see it i mean in every grocery store there's a whole rotisserie chicken that costs less than one pound of my raw chicken mm. okay and sometimes that chicken's even organic in the mm. rotisserie section right so the distortion <laughs> between like the mainstream costs and the regenerative costs is so massive but I think that our costing is probably more like it is in a more sustainable system, which doesn't mean that not everybody gets meat. It means that we're going to be eating more cuts of meat, more diverse cuts of meat. We're going to be doing better utilization, throwing a, I mean, think about it. We could afford 40% more in our meat dollar if we just didn't throw away 40% of it. Totally. That's the math. So there's a big savings right there. And gosh, if people who are raising in feedlots paid the real cost of their price, well, there's like another 70% right there. And all of a sudden we're on the same playing field with a Bel Campo and a mainstream meat. So it's a it's not like it's that far, right? And it's not like there's no path to get there. It's definitely needs to be a cultural shift around how we prioritize meat, how we use it, what we're willing to pay for it. And I think the the sad kind of other alternative, especially if the world of carbon credits and a broader understanding of carbon impact continues is that it may be that or fake meat, you know? It depends on how that movement shifts, right? So the cheap meat of the world could become fake meat unless we can fix the meat. Mm. Is that, I so ideal, ideal case is we fix the meat and, and all the things that you outlined. Is it better to have that bifurcation then where it's real meat or, you know, meat like you're talking about that's, and then fake meat as the as the general is that better on a holistic standpoint not from a carbon perspective hmm. because the fake meat i mean i think a possible burger is four pounds of carbon per patty so that's i think we sequester like three pounds per quarter pound or half pound or burger and then so. do you know the do you know what it is for a uh, conventionally factory farmed burger not versus a not off hand but you think it's less than an i think they're slightly burger. higher than impossible i think impossible but they it's a so that that delta is going to be in their favor but it's still yeah. not a carbon negative right um impact and it's also highly processed food right so you know if you look at the pure nutritionals on a on a conventional beef patty and a Bill Campo patty, we're like a one to one omega three to six ratio, which is the same as game. They're somewhere between one to 15 and one to 30, which yeah. is an, a straight up inflammatory ratio. Right. Right. So, but is that, well, you would know more than me if that's worse than the hyper processed estrogenase, everything that's in the soy burgers. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting to take a look at that. I mean, from a, it's it would be hard i would have to really take a look i don't eat impossible anything you know like that's not i try to eat as only ethically sourced meat you know wherever i go and doesn't mean that occasionally out on the road somewhere i'll have you know some healthier burger like there's a burger place out here called p terry's and it's natural burgers and i i i do participate in that blind eye okay p terry's your natural burgers let me just close my eyes just enough and eat your delicious natural burger. And, you know, and the, so, but as I look forward, if I really wanted to prioritize myself as an energetic being and as a, as a spiritual being beyond just the, the nutritionals of what might be happening in the processing and the preservatives and the macronutrients and then the depletions of the soil. So it's not actually giving you mineral, all of the different things. I really think for me, fuck all that. Like, what about, what if I really care about being the best human that I could be in the divine perspective, like moving towards spirit and source? And and if I really, really prioritize that enough over these other things, that is kind of the place where I really want to go, where mm -hmm. I'm like called to go is to make that choice. Because the other path is just efficiency technology you know mass mass things but it's missing that it's missing the heart it's missing mm -hmm. that feeling that i get when i'm connected to the unicity and i see all life as the same and because it's all 
that vibrant pulsing energy of of source mm-hmm. of of the materia prima the the essence of life itself of love expressed and all of these things being in alignment with that that to me feels like that to me feels like the thing that i want to focus on you know and and there's great you know scientists and nutrition analysts and different people who can look at all of the other things but i'm very confident that if i ate food that i knew was from a garden that people cared about it and i ate animals from a place that was nurtured and i had fish from an ocean that was wild you know and still had all of the diversity and health of that like i would start to feel like that wild natural human Mm -hmm. in the divine accord that i really crave Mm -hmm. and i think that to me is you know if i was going to give my advice now of course if you want to correct something all right sometimes i'll recommend a a ketogenic diet or shifting your macronutrients and being mindful of this but but moving more into like how do i live in the in the in the beauty way mm-hmm. as is often said like how can i live in the beauty way mm-hmm. and uh and to me that is that's the most important because we're, we're running a dangerous path where we're going to use technological efficiency over efficiency over efficiency until all we have is technology and we've starved ourselves of the beauty of nature and life and god I th- yeah and i, th- I think i re- respect that and i hear that and i think that is an incredibly enlightened way of looking at responsibility when it comes to animals and everything right i I think that the moment we have now of of this technological solution that you're talking about um if we look down the road i don't think what we're worried about right now is going to be the problem 15 years ago when gmos started taking off we were very worried about what those modified genes would do inside of our body. Now we're not. Now we're worried about the chemical that we have engineered to make those genes resistant to has actually been the killer, right? So it wasn't at all what we anticipated in any specific way. So I think learning from that experience, we can say we don't really know what's going to go off the rails with that, um, but we evolved in concert with nature. And, you know, they... they, what animal husbandry used to be would be somebody following animals around and managing them lightly as they followed them. The animals led. That's what hunting is, animal yeah. leads. And the transhumans, right? That's a typical thing throughout the world where you take animals from the low pastures in the summer and either to the, the spring, you move going from low to high with seasonality. And you do that following the animals, following their lead, following their migratory patterns of generations. Tribes followed animals, right? And for for millennia. So we've turned this animal-led approach to this massive source of the most source of of nutrition. I mean, whether or not you're vegan or you can agree that in history, meat has been the crucial element to human brain development, human energetic potential. Cooking meat is another massive move forward in terms of making more energy more readily available. So there's been these milestones around cultural development that are just rock solid that have to do with humans securing continuous access for multiple generations to meet, right? We followed them. The modern system, we've tried to dominate them. And it's it's a system that has become broken because it's it's not the way that we evolved for this to be led, right? So animal-led agriculture is kind of what we're doing, right? It's animal wellness in mm-hmm. support of human wellness. But if I look back at that energetic circle that you're talking about, you're choosing to follow, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And to, to follow their lead, let them find their health and then feed yourself from their health. Yeah. I would say in a historical perspective, that's more continuous with successful human evolution than the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. So for people who want, who kind of find resonance with what we're talking about, obviously, Belcampo, you guys ship all over the country. There's people in different countries. There's people all over the place, people who you know might not be able to afford that path, but might be able to go to Whole Foods or go somewhere and might be able to make some different choices along the way. When you're looking at, let's say you do go to Whole Foods and they have those animal welfare, one, two, three, four, as just an example, you know, like 
how much of a difference does it make when you start moving up those you know what you're able to see on the package because you're disconnected from the farm yeah it, it, huge difference i mean certifications are a proxy for contact with the farm best case scenario i'm your farmer you come over you see the animals even if i don't have any certifications you're yeah, fine with it. Sure. You talk to me, you're like, Anya, what's happening? And I can tell you. And if I can speak knowledgeably to things and you understand, that's the ultimate, right? Not very probable, but that is an option for people. If they have the time, there are CSAs across the US where you can buy direct, you can buy a quarter or an eighth of an animal, mm -hmm. put it in your freezer. You can talk to the guy, you can own that system. So that's, I'd say, a pinnacle experience. If you can't do that, you need to rely on certifications. And this is something where I have really leaned into organic certification for Belcampo. Um, so we're becoming 100% organic certified. In the past, we've run both lines because you know we'll give a baby calf like a pink eye drop in its eye if it gets an infection that takes it out of the organic program. So there's been some, as we scale, some challenges in keeping that and also needing to market all of our meat. Sure. But now we're getting bigger so we can actually guarantee a full supply chain of organic certified. And we also are humane certified that those are key proxies, and I love the accountability that it brings our team. You know, I think about it with people saying, "Well, I, you know, I'm not organic um, certified, but I do it all." It's like saying, "You know, I, 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 I pay my taxes. I just don't file the 1040." Like, yeah. you're kind of like, "Well, I trust you, but I don't, I don't really know if that's as accountable, sure. right? Even if you wrote a bigger check, is it as accountable? Because even I can think of you know a dozen ways as I'm talking right now where organic certification has brought better accountability to our team. And it hasn't captured everything we do. 80% of what we do is far beyond organic. Mm -hmm. Rotational grazing, soil carbon monitoring, um, you know, intensive um, packs of animals moving them around, interspecies management, none of that riparian habitat management. Um, hedgerows, uh, wild animal integration, like none of that stuff gets integrated into what organic cares about. But those are, it doesn't really matter to me. That purse, that bit of rigor around record keeping is actually a really good thing. And then, then the other piece that you're looking for is humane, some type of humane certification. Whole Foods does a great job. I think the Whole Foods system is actually really good in that it gives people those levels. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very clear. And for me, it's like four and above is what you should be looking right. for there. Uh, Which maybe, is almost impossible to get pork. At four and above yeah. at the Whole Foods that I've been. I mean, you're it's usually one. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that's where I appreciate their integrity. Right. Right. And I appreciate their integrity. And when it is that way, they're letting you know. And that's very different, you know, where people will just mark it natural, right? But they've held themselves accountable to a more transparent standard. Right. I I think that the the by species though, just my cheat list at the grocery store is this for ruminants, which is um multi stomach. So you have five stomachs. These are animals that evolved eating low calorie, low density nutrition, the stuff that humans couldn't eat, right? Mm -hmm. Grasses, forage, bark, all those different things. Those are ruminants, the ones that we eat the most of our beef, lamb, and, and pork. For ruminants, the number one thing you're looking for is grass fed and grass finished. And another way that's said is 100% grass fed. Mm -hmm. That's the number one thing that I'm looking for. Second would be organic. And third would be some type of humane certification. Yeah. There's a bunch of them. I don't really care which one, but one of them is good to have. Yeah. And if I... I'm going to choose one of the three. It's 100% grass-fed and finished. For on a, like the monogastric, which is one stomach, like a human, can eat high-density, high-calorie foods, thrive on them. You know, chickens can't eat grass. Pigs can't eat grass. Our chickens get 15% of their nutrition from grass. Mm -hmm. Pigs is more like 10, 8 to 10%. And they'll eat things like pumpkins and almonds and other stuff too if we can get them. So for those animals, the number one thing I'm looking for is pastured, not free-range, Free range means you have access to the outdoors, but it doesn't mean that you actually have any incentive to be outdoors at any time. So sure. pastured actually means they are out on the majority of their lives, low density on pastured. Second is organic and third is some type of humane. But yeah. again, if it's between organic and pastured, I'll choose pastured. If it's between organic and grass fed and finished, I'll choose grass fed and finished. Mm. Those are more meaningful in actually in the nutritional composition of the product. Sure. Because I've seen plenty of product out there. We, we do third-party testing every quarter uh, with a lab of all of our nutritionals and micros on all of our products, put them up on our website, and we, we don't publish these, but we competitive test as well. And we see values all over the map for grass-fed product because grass-fed means it has a little bit of grass at any time in its life. 
right? But it doesn't mean it's grass fed throughout the whole life. Sure. And you can you can lose a one to one ratio in ten days on grain. That's been shown at a University of Chico. It's like it changes really radically. So the fatty acid profile, which is like if you're just watching out for you in this, which is you know synergistic because the regenerative stuff is better for human health too. If you're just watching out for you, you want to pay attention to omega three to omega six ratio, and that is entirely dependent on 100% grass fed. What about um, buffalo bison? Love it. I mean, it's a great, delicious product. I think culinarily, it's a little more challenging for people because of the density of the muscles, the, mm -hmm. I mean, the massive musculature, right? I heard that it's illegal to actually you know, do some of the practices, some of the factory practices with the buffalo. Somehow it's a USDA or national, national law that you can't corn fed corn feed a buffalo for its whole life but i do think that um and this is from we work with tonka who makes you know a oh, buffalo yeah. bison product. Yeah, it's a great product um but there are ways in which at the end of the life they can finish them on some kind of finish them on some kind of grain or something so but i don't think that certification is too clear on mm -hmm. when you're going to buy the buffalo or bison in the uh in the store but I, it is something that energetically always feels good when I when I have a buffalo yeah, meat, yeah, I, I mean I think it's a delicious um, product. I like I'll cook buffalo and bison like the same way I cook a beef heart. Mm -hmm. I like an anticucho rub, like do paprika and cumin, and actually put suet on it, and then grill nice. that really hot and fast, and make it medium rare with a really nice crust. So those dense, massive muscles. I mean, they've, they're very slow growing, so they've got that solubility and that very very lean, tight, compact musculature. They, they, on the feeding, I, 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 I'm not familiar with that specifically, but there's a really, there's a bunch of really nasty workarounds in grass fed and finished mm -hmm. um, that have to do with feeding pelletized grass seed to animals, okay, which is like not that different from a grain from an omega profile, um, but you can still technically call it, so you can feed grass seed right. to cow and still call it a, a grass fed and finished. You can use sorghum, which is a grass, but it's basically like sugar cane. You can also use a sprouted grain. Um, so you can sprout wheat or sprout corn. But you know, the difference between like a sprouted almond and a regular sure. almond, it's not noticeably from a micronutrient perspective, not very different. Right. So there's a number of workarounds around grass. So that may be what what's happening with and you just get, you know, triple the nutrient density, um, which right. creates the the you know, with the cow's microbiome, I mean, they're basically getting inflammatory fats when you feed them those diets and they actually are inflamed animals. You, you're still not going to get the same type of weight gain, but in general, if you see a super marbled piece of, <laughs> of grass-fed meat, you should be pretty suspect around it typically. You know, it's very difficult to, it's the same thing with anything, you know, like if you're walking around and only eating spinach for 26 months, it's pretty difficult to have a ton of extra muscular and intramuscular fat. Yeah. If you're sitting immobile, immobilized with a seatbelt on your couch, eating Fritos for 16 months, it's pretty easy to put on a lot of weight. Sure. So this whole thing of like the meat, you know, is precious for being prime. You know, prime is just the visual grade of fat. It's actually a visual grade of inflammation, right? That's all prime means. Nothing about safety, nothing about USDA, nothing about quality, handling, traceability, nada, nothing. Just a dude looks at it, holds up a card, percentage of fat, eyeballs it, that's prime. Yeah. And so people are vaunting these like big claims, like it's prime or it's natural. These are really meaningless, meaningless claims. But to- Kind of like, like kosher, where that just means a rabbi took a look at it and was like, yep, It also looks good. <laughs> technically means it dies of blood loss, mm. which is why you can't get kosher certified humane. Mm. Okay. So, but there's kind of an interesting wrinkle on that one, which is that- Back in like the 1600s, the biggest issue with killing beef, the reason we eat a lot of, ate a lot of pigs in history is that they're, they've got a lot of meat on them. They eat garbage, right? They can't eat garbage and thrive. And by garbage, I mean like, you know, scraps, compost sure. pile kind of stuff. But they're also a good size to handle in terms of the blood, right? When you kill a beef, there's a ton of blood. And that's the biggest risk historically is putrefaction and meat going off. You know this as a hunter, right? You got to get the blood off of the muscles really quickly. Sure. People, when they get meat in a bag and they see a red liquid, they're like, oh, it's full of blood. No, there's no blood ever on meat. Blood is sticky and thick, right? What you see is a little myoglobin water coming out. That's not blood. The blood getting out of the musculature, out of the veins is the key thing for putrefaction. So kosher was very smart at the time because... 
the animals were died of blood loss. So their own hearts pumped the blood entirely out of their body, minimizing the risk of putrefaction. Yeah. So that's actually pretty dope from a historical perspective that the rabbi was like watching out for their safety. In today's world, we have the machinery where we can take a 1,200, 1,500 pound animal after um, killing it with a captive bolt humanely and quickly, and we can eviscerate it and remove all the blood within seconds. Mm. Right, So that need to die technically by blood loss is a non-issue. We have a much cleaner and better way to manage for putrefaction yeah. with blood. So that is, an, I think, a truly, I mean, independent of the belief system around it, it's definitely outdated from a humane perspective, right? Yeah. And the idea of like, it's a very sharp knife and it's like, it doesn't matter. I mean, bullet to the head or death by blood loss, anybody would say the bullet to the head is going to be more humane, Also, right? yeah, that, that quick death too, you know, prevents that cortisol release. Any animal, a hunter knows any animal that's been, you know, with a gut shot has been running and you've been tracking it and that meat is going to be a lot tougher exactly. from that, from that cortisol stress. release and yeah. stress that's going to be coming out. Last question about these meats here. Why is an A5 Kobe beef so damn delicious? And is it? And am I cheating and says this bad? Because it really is good. I think everything in moderation. You know, an A5 Kobe is delicious because suet is delicious because fat's delicious, uh -huh. right? So all and and it's also so you basically have these beautiful little tender shreds of slow growing beef surrounded by one of the world's most delicious foods, which is beef fat. And it's also beef fat that's been encapsulated in musculature. So it doesn't, you know, the cap of a New York steak, right? Mm -hmm. It's delicious, but it's a little raunchy. You know, it's like, yum, I want a bite, but not five bites. If yeah. You know what I'm talking about? So I, the, the, the meat, the intramuscular fats, especially precious because it never has air exposure and it has no exposure to, you know, cut surfaces or any meat with any enzymatic action. So it doesn't absorb, because fat absorbs flavor. So it absorbs none of the kind of like gaminess or muskiness of beef. So it's got this very, very clean, clean flavor. It's the same as suet fat, mm. you know, and that that fully encapsulated, but it's even more encapsulated. So that's part of it. It's very clean and very delicious fat with just shreds of beautiful musculature around it. And are the animals in the in the Kobe system, are they treated well? Or, are the, or is this like, is this just delicious animals? It's just delicious. Dang I, it. Yeah, unfortunately. I thought they were massaged. There's all kinds of rumors about are, like, all of the ways. I mean, the they're treated that, well by like, if, if you're a lazy boy guy who wants to watch TV and eat Fritos and get a foot massage, <laughs> then they're treated well, right? Like that's like the analogy of it. I knew it was cheating. <laughs> I knew it. I sensed Everything it. in moderation. But yeah, they, they, that's the ultimate confinement animal. Yeah. I mean, it's just confined with more luxury. Um, so is it, as, as a sentient being, unhappy? Well, I'd say the difference between that and the conventional system is it's not mired in its own waste. It's not surrounded by lagoons of putrefaction. It's not fed, um, you know, well, it's fed the same type of high calorie diet. So it's like Rapunzel in her, you know, castle being, yeah, being held in a. I wouldn't say that of, no the, of the issues in animal ag, Wagyu's not like pinnacle issue. Mm -hmm. um, I do see it as just inflamed meat though. Yeah. I um, I ate it for, for years um, as a beef lover and, and the more I learned about the production system and then also seeing the insides of the stomachs, it's pretty compelling. If you look at the rumen, like inside the gut of a grass-fed and finished animal compared to animal that's been eating nutrient-dense foods, like what the Wagyu eats, the, those ones are black and shiny and smell terrible. And the grass-fed ones are just like pink and <laughs> mm -hmm. smell like grass. You know, it's, it's such a different, the intestinal health thing. When I saw that stuff, I was like, okay, I can't can't even do the wagyu yep. anymore well it's um, been a good run wagyu and kobe <laughs> we've had a good we've had a good run <laughs> try now suet. the truth <laughs> <laughs> try some suet with it yeah for um, sure. but i'd say that it, again it's not it's to me it's like the sort of fetishization of it is a little bizarre because it's so unhealthy for the animals and that fat is also the ratio of inflammatory fats is very high in that yeah but that said there it isn't an abusive confinement system at all right um and and honestly, I mean, unlike, I don't know, actually, I've had the experience, I've tried in the early days of Belcampo, I experimented with doing like a barley ration with our cows. We put barley out there and um, we couldn't get them to eat it. You know, we found that you actually have to have animals in confinement where they don't have access to green grass. Mm. But I think unlike bison, which actually will probably never switch to a pure grain diet, cows, I mean, they're, they aren't as kind of awake and aware as other animals. I don't know, like on a sentient scale, how much they suffer. But they also do have a genetic predisposition to, uh, to weight gain. 
I have raised that breed on our farm in the early days of Belcampo, experimented with a pure Wagyu. In a natural system, you can get that fat on it. It took us five years though. Mm. Okay. So they did get that. I'm not sure it was an A5. That's like more white than red. Right. We probably got to like two or three levels below that. And that was some of the most delicious meat I've ever, mm. I mean, mind-blowingly delicious. But it took us five years to get that weight and they get it in like 24 months. So two years to five years. So it's yeah. that's that speed of growth. You really only get that with that hypernutrient dense food. So, Well, thank you for doing what you do. Hey, Thank thanks for, for enjoying it so much. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's been a big, you know, one of those big positives that have come into my life, just getting access. And I, you know, we had our, told this story already, I think on this podcast, but we had our snowmageddon, snowpocalypse out here in Austin. And it just so happened that I just received a whole box of, I got brisket and a lamb roast and everything. So we were eating so good during that whole time where a lot of people were short on food and we were just stocked up. And uh, and now that I got some even some more recipes from, <laughs> from you, I'm going to keep this I know you're gonna going to be cooking the liver. No doubt. No doubt. We got that all ready to go. So yeah, thank you for uh, for everything. And, and hopefully this message will continue to inspire people to uh, find the beauty way with all of, their, all of their meat foods. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. And uh, where do people go to uh, to shop Belcampo? Belcampo.com. And we have a code for your followership for Sweet. just just your first name, just Aubrey. And that's that'll get you 20% off um, for new customers. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, Belcampo.com, at Belcampo Mico. And then um, I'm at, at Anya Fernald. Love it. That's love it. it. Thank you, everybody. Much love. Peace. Thanks for checking out this video. For more like it, please subscribe to my channel. And of course, the Aubrey Marcus podcast with new episodes every single week. And follow me on Instagram at Aubrey Marcus. Thank you so much.